This is Johnny Gould's Jewish State. North America, Europe, the whole of the Middle East. The world is listening. 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 Here's a couple of statements. The Middle East is a region of ever-shifting interests. And the Middle East is a region of steadfast values and beliefs. And when the latter and the former come together, change for the better follows. Normalization, cooperation, commerce, partnerships, solutions, and growing understanding and tolerance. In a wider world fixated on the geopolitical threat from a new Russia-China axis, there is quiet yet decisive diplomatic leadership coming from the United Arab Emirates. And its impact is being felt both regionally and globally. And the Abraham Accords is playing a vital role in helping secure that stability. The Middle East is a work in progress. And the UAE sees itself as a bridge between the East and West. But where does this leave Israel and its Western allies in the Middle East? After the euphoria of September 2020, when relations between Israel, the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco and Sudan were normalized, where are we now headed? What can we hope for? Could more Arab nations join the Accords? Is the judicial reform wobble in Israel's domestic politics a worry for regional relations? This is an episode on how diplomacy is reaching for higher ground in a troubled region. And how those visions are translating into facts on the ground. Let's also look beyond adverse headlines for COP28 in Dubai in November. Isn't a world-leading energy provider actually the perfect setting for the future of green energy? You can't just throw an oil and gas-powered infrastructure worldwide away overnight, the energy transition will take decades, experts are saying until the 2050s. So what steps should the world take during this period from old to new? COVID-19 spelt opportunity for the Gulf and Israel, even in the throes of emergency. The UAE and Israel proved world leaders in tackling the global pandemic and seeds of trust grew. They found their common approach to tackling COVID showed that actually they had much in common. Instrumental in those meetings was Len Khodorkovsky. Len served at the US State Department as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Global Public Affairs. He was also a senior advisor to the US Special Representative for Iran and the Chief Marketing Officer of America's Economic Diplomacy. The press dubbed him the State Department's secret weapon. Meeting by meeting, slowly but surely, all of these uh, key people were finding themselves in a room talking about issues that they had in common. They, they found trust uh, among each other, uh, dealing with an issue of national security. But gradually, talking about security issues turned into uh, uh, you know, finding common ground on other issues like uh, economic issues or healthcare issues, certainly during COVID or, uh, or, or uh, uh, educational research. So gradually those face-to-face -face meetings uh, yielded real relationships among decision makers in all of these countries. And I think, um, you know, it just seemed like the moment was right and seeds of the Abraham Accords were happening throughout because of our continual cooperation against our common threat, which was the Islamic Republic of Iran. Len was part of the Trump administration, but now the United States is in full retreat in the Middle East, even though they're still concerned about China's growing economic influence through the region. And yet Joe Biden's administration never counted. There's been no push for extra peace deals since President Trump's term. Step forward, the United Arab Emirates. Since signing the Abraham Accords in 2020, the UAE has engaged in mature 21st century politics, discreetly shaping regional peace and stability, working for consensus and good neighborliness. 
But should Israelis worry about that and their own political turbulence over judicial reform and that impact on newfound friendships in the Gulf? Perhaps not. The Emiratis are playing a progressive long game. Explaining the change of heart, open minds and a realisation of what Israel really is and has to offer to strong and stable governments everywhere is His Excellency Mansour Abul Hul, the Emirati ambassador to the UK based in London. Now we can truly understand what Israel means to the UAE, to the Arab world, to the Muslim community and move from You know, if you think decades ago, there was a general indoctrination um, and we can move from that those sort of ideological restraints to to politics, to actually engaging on multiple levels to to see how we can build bridges and links and also tackle some of the pressing issues through dialogue and communication. The Israeli president and prime minister have both visited the Emirates. Hundreds of Israelis and Emirati firms trade with each other and a new deal signed in May 2023 removes 96% of all tariffs on goods between the countries. Commercial routes are budding across borders. Our crowd's CEO, John Medved, is leading the vanguard for commercial advancement from the Israeli side. And he talks about the virtuous circle of peace and security, which has led to such a huge uptick in trade and understanding and peace in the Middle East. You know, it was once described several years ago as the worst kept secret in the Middle East, the relationship between the Emirates and Israel. Now it's out in the open. But the reality is that I think most people misunderstand how important this is and what a huge game changer it is. From the very onset and even before, I've been active at our crowd in uh, hopefully leading in this, you know, historic rapprochement or historic normalization. And the reality is that we quickly moved to hire a team led by Emiratis in the Gulf, led by Dr. Sabah al-Banali, who runs our operation there. We're making investments in the Gulf. It's not just about Emirati money meeting Israeli startups. It's about Israeli investors investing there Our companies are busy working on joint ventures. And when you take these two entrepreneurial societies, and I'm saying deliberately two entrepreneurial societies because the Emiratis have built this incredible uh, state, very, very modern, very, very far thinking, whether it's sending missions to Mars or working on artificial intelligence or building food security with next generation food technology. The Emiratis are worthy partners, okay, and they they get it. And what we, what we don't fully understand is that what has happened is that a sand curtain has essentially dropped, okay? It's like the Iron Curtain. Back when the Berlin Wall fell, the world changed. And no matter what people want to do in terms of reestablishing, you know, those bad old days, it's not going to happen. Right. In other words, there is openness in the heart of Europe that will never change. And that's what's happened now in the Middle East. And people don't get it. This is not just a temporary blip. This is a historic trend where Jews and Arabs will no longer be known for their fighting, but be known for their cooperation and their joint leadership of the world. In preparation for this episode, I went to the Israeli embassy in London and spoke to Ambassador Tzipi Chotoveli, Israel's ambassador to the UK, and firstly, Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Fleur Hassan Nahum, who's also co-founder and founding member of the UAE Israel Business Council. The swirling interests of the Middle East change with every month. We have seen a rapprochement between Iran and the United Arab Emirates, between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and Syria are being welcomed back into the Arab League fold, and they're going to be at COP28, presenting problems, diplomatic issues for the West to go and be in the same room. However, tell me good things about the Abraham Accords and the relationship between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Well, you have to look at the relationship between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Israel, Bahrain, and Israel and Morocco. And all that in terms of trade, cultural, um, 
events, uh, agreements, anything you can think of is flourishing. There's more Israeli tourists in these countries than ever. We have more trade delegations coming to Israel from the Arab world than ever. Um, so I'm very optimistic. Look, in any relationship, especially a new relationship, there's always bumps on the road. And we may have some bumps on the road, and I think every time there's a conflict with Gaza, when Gaza tries to tell the Muslim world falsely that somehow we're changing the status quo on the Al-Aqsa Temple Mount or that we're barging into the Al-Aqsa Temple Mount, all these falsities, they use that emotionally in order to get the Arab and Muslim world against us. And that creates a little bit of discomfort only for a few days and then we're back on track. So, and, and I know that under the radar, other countries in the Gulf want to join the Abraham Accords. They're getting a bit of FOMO. And so I'm long term, I'm optimistic that it'll happen. It has to happen at the pace that different countries with their own internal issues are comfortable with, but it's moving in the right direction. Diplomatically, the UAE has a foreign policy to be friends with everyone, however yes. disparate those friends are. Hashtag tolerance, hashtag unity. So should Israel be concerned about the swirling relationships that the UAE has with what seems to be foes before? Well, I, I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't say that the UAE um, normalizing or the Saudi normalizing with Iran, I, I don't think that means that now they love each other. I think that means that they want to put some type of detente into the conflict in Yemen. Um, and I think that was the main, um, the main purpose. And I think also signaling to America, you know, get in the game or, or be left out. I think that's really what's going on there. I don't think that the normalization that they've done with Iran prevents a normalization with the state of Israel. And I wanted to get Ambassador Tsipi Khotovelli's take on the regional and global issues facing Israel and its allies in the world, on the growing influence of China, Iran's military role on Russia's side in the Ukraine, and her steadfast belief in the stability of the Abraham Accords. Ambassador Khotovelli, here we are at the Israeli embassy. There's been a sudden diplomatic shift in the Middle East with rapprochements between Saudi Arabia and Iran, between the UAE and Iran, the welcoming back of Syria into the Arab League, their invite to COP28. This is quite a lot for Israel to deal with in relation to the UAE and Bahrain with the Abraham Accords. Ambassador Khotovelli, what is your view of the Abraham Accords with these new rapprochements in the Arab world? First of all, the Abraham Accords is the best um, way to... Uh to have peace in our region and I think it's been very successful and I'm very optimistic that more countries will follow. So I'm starting my uh, take on that, first of all, with optimism. Uh, definitely Iran is our biggest concern and I must say that uh, the fact that you see um, the Saudis um, collaborating now together with the Chinese as well as part of the, the mediator of, the, of this deal is something the whole West should be concerned about and we are concerned very much about the fact that um, Iran at the moment is uh, a major factor also with the Russian cooperation. So even people that want to concentrate on the Ukraine war must understand that Iran is a threat. If you want to uh, make sure that you get uh, the Ukrainian support, you need to break the link between Iran and Russia. In order to do that, you need to fight Iran uh, more strongly. So my thought is to focus on extending normalization. And the second thing is keep the battle against Iran because this is still the top national priority. The relationship with the UAE has been wonderful. The peace deal between the Gulf nations has been different to that of Jordan and Egypt. There is a great deal more warmth. Does the warmth still endure as interests swirl around the Middle East? Um, I hope I understand, but I think the people-to-people -people level, I think the people-to-people -people level is the key for any peace. And uh, I think this is something can inspire us all about how Israelis been welcomed as tourists. Half million Israelis travel to um, Dubai last year, and I think Bahrain is also very welcoming, and also Morocco. Uh, personally, I have great relationship with my colleague ambassadors here, and uh, it's been really the best time to serve as an ambassador when the Middle East is uh, is changing. So I'm, I'm still. Uh, happy about this change and uh, hope we can do more things together for the prosperity of the region. Ambassador Khotovali, thank you very much. Thanks.
In another gesture of tolerance and unity, the Emiratis opened the Abrahamic House, a religious campus in Abu Dhabi with a mosque, a church and a synagogue where all three faiths worship in harmony. It's the first synagogue to open in the Arab world for a century. The chief rabbi of the UK and Commonwealth was there to witness the synagogue's opening. Scroll back to episode 106 to hear his comments. And after the recent Turkey-Syria earthquake, which killed 50,000 people, the Emiratis played an unprecedented role in influencing Syria to open humanitarian corridors to the disaster victims. Without that intervention, thousands more would have died. The UAE then followed up with the distribution of over $100 million worth of aid. And in April 2023, the UAE signed a trade deal with Turkey that could double trade to $40 billion by 2028. The Emiratis are opening communication, expanding diplomatic and mediation efforts, and avoiding confrontation. In the absence of the US, the UAE is on the front foot with constructive engagement towards its traditional rivals, even foes, Israel, Qatar, Turkey and Iran. At the same time, the UAE, the host of COP28, has signed a deal with the US to spend $100 billion on clean energy projects, adding 100 gigawatts globally by 2035. The Emirates has been criticised for appointing His Excellency Sultan Ahmed al Jaber, Chief Executive of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, as President-designate of COP28, and the Emirates Special Envoy for Climate Change, and if you're in the West, and in particular exposed to London-based media, the same line criticising his appointment is parroted without counter. The Emirates is a highly experienced energy provider, so why is Western media critical of COP28 staged in Dubai? Shall we hear a Gulf opinion now? This is Majid Hamid Jafar, CEO of Crescent Petroleum, the Middle East's oldest privately held oil and gas company. So when you say there's been uh, controversy, the, maybe from a London perspective. <laughs> <laughs> not here or not in the seven billion. And that's the real problem, the real concern I have is this sort of high horse virtue signaling from, I'll call it what it is, forgive my bluntness, from places like Europe, which are threatening to undermine the entire process. So we saw at COP26, first of all, let's look at the last two COPs, Scotland and Egypt, both oil and gas producers, right? None of the controversy that you refer to. So there's a double standard there to start with. COP26, the oil, gas, nuclear, and coal industries were deplatformed. These are the industries that produce 90% of global energy. They were not even part of the conversation. And it wasn't even the British government. Mm. It was a certain agenda that took over the COP office. And it undermined the whole meeting. We also saw finger wag wagging at the climate, uh, at the developing countries, India and others, who have been waiting for the $100 billion of climate finance that was promised in Paris and has never come forward. So what did we see in Sharm el-Sheikh? The language changed. The seven billion now are not talking about the hundred billion. President, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India said should be at least a trillion to start with anyway. They are now talking about loss and damage. They are now talking about you, the developed countries, who colonized all of Asia and Africa, used our resources to fuel your own industrial development, and are now somehow lecturing us that we shouldn't have stable power while you enjoy it. And what's the first thing you all did in Europe at the first sign of a crisis? You all turned your coal plants back on. Every single one of you is subsidizing energy that you lectured us not to. Except if you're rich, they don't call it subsidy if you're a rich country. So in the UK, it's energy support. But it's 50% of your electricity bill is an energy subsidy. And the third thing you're all doing now is coming to the developing countries, like in Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania, asking for the gas you refuse to finance for their own power as long as it goes to Europe as LNG, because you're worried about your own electricity supply. That's the hypocrisy, frankly, 
that is grating in developing countries today in Africa and Asia. Why the UAE? It's the perfect place in my view. First of all, it's a big investor in all forms of energy. Not just in oil and gas, but in renewables. Masdar was established way before other countries grabbed the mantle. And actually, uh, Dr. Sultan al Jabbar was and still is the chairman of Masdar before his role in ADNOC. That's not being, of course, uh, reported. And proving up hydrogen at scale is going to come from countries like Saudi and the UAE that have the resources, both funding and the gas supply, to be able to uh, advance these technologies. Second reason, the geography. This is the best place to bring north, south, east and west, which is what is needed for a true dialogue. And the third uh, and important uh, point which is related to that is the unique relationships the UAE has with African countries, with the Asian countries, which are so important because ultimately this whole challenge is going to be won or lost there. And the venue itself, the expo, was granted to Dubai because it was the first expo that paid for the LDCs, the lesser developed countries, to have their own pavilions, the poorest countries from places like Africa. So it is an inclusive venue for the world. So I think for all those reasons, it's going to be an inclusive COP, a successful COP, and it's the ideal uh, uh, venue, regardless of supposed controversies and narrow, narrow dialogues that may happen in Europe. And the energy transition is becoming an election issue here in the UK. It's called net zero over here. The UK's shadow business secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, says if elected, Labour plans to end new North Sea oil exploration. That's from 2024 onwards. You heard me correctly. Plans to end new North Sea oil exploration from 2024 onwards. But he insists it would create more jobs by encouraging development of renewable energy resources. We will see in the North Sea existing oil and gas fields continue to produce well up until 2050 for the 28,000 directly employed uh, people in that sector. They'll continue to work in that sector. But the big opportunity comes from the transition and we don't think further new oil and gas fields are the answer. First of all because they won't do anything for bills, they won't do anything for our energy security, they cost a lot of public subsidy, they clearly be a, a climate disaster. But also there are better alternatives available and it's by embracing that change our plans for public investment, for public stakes in things like gigafactories and the transition to green steel, for renewables, for storage, for nuclear. That is where the future is. And of course, the number of jobs that will be created by that is far in excess of the jobs currently there. But as I say, those people will continue to work in that sector till 2050. And at the same time, the kind of jobs are being created, the roles will be the same. They're jobs for electricians and engineers and surveyors and technicians and people who will be required in this new area. So we are trying to get the balance right. I think we are being proportional in it. We're looking at what is the biggest opportunity. So we will not grant further licenses, but we will not turn off our existing supplies or licenses that have been granted before we form the Labour government that we want to create. And look, this is about the future and the chance and the opportunity for the UK is enormous. There are particular competitive advantages that we've got as a country in things like offshore wind, in hydrogen, in what storage will mean. And we cannot protect bill payers or our energy security by remaining hooked on fossil fuels. The alternatives are better, they're cheaper, they're more compelling. And embracing this big opportunity is so important to the UK. And I understand, to be frank, in the past, under Conservative governments, big economic transitions in the UK have not been handled well. I mean, I, I grew up in the coal fields of County Durham. I can guarantee there'll be further job opportunities, more jobs created in the energy sector in Scotland from our plans. And that's true, actually, of every part of the UK. normalizing relations with Israel and signing the world's biggest deals with the US to promote sustainability among nations worst hit by climate change. This is the delicate art of diplomacy, not waiting for a rubber stamp approval or even seeking the spotlight. The UK's recent integrated review of diplomatic and defense priorities commits Britain to working with all who support an open and stable international order and the protection of global public goods. That's Israel, the UAE, Bahrain, 
Morocco. And with the superpowers distracted, the UAE is showing itself to be a durable ally of Israel and a reliable member of the UN Security Council in 2023 amid a crisis of confidence in that organization. Despite the swirling winds of interests, the durability and purpose of the Abraham Accords seems steadfast. If you've just hopped on board Johnny Gould's Jewish State, you are welcome. There's a 24-7 live stream of our shows. Just tap this into your browser. www.jewishstate.radio www.jewishstate.radio Subscribe to the podcast and tell your friends and spool back a few episodes of a new Gulf Arab generation. They ring out in the name of peace with Loe Al-Sharif. I recorded this in Abu Dhabi. Jews and Muslims, Arabs and Israelis were always destined to be together. And since we live in the same region, the Middle East, it would be better for us and for our region, for our children and grandchildren to live in peace, prosperity, security, rather than just living in a continuous conflict. Johnny Gould's Jewish State. The podcast of record. Apple podcast number ones throughout the world. Subscribe now and tell your friends.